Hello and welcome to The Intentional Clinician. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, Licensed Professional Counselor. Today's episode is part two of my conversation with Brian Sabatino, owner of Inner Work Counseling in Tempe, Arizona. We pick up right in the middle of our conversation where Brian is about to read a story that he quotes in his book. We are going to talk again about mindfulness, addiction, recovery, and a lot of philosophy that can help people. Uh, This particular story where Brian's about to read is very interesting as it has a lot to do with our conversation. And if you are just tuning in to the Intentional Clinician podcast, I would encourage you to go back and listen to the episode right before this one so you know what we're talking about. The reason I wasn't able to put the full episode is because the length was too long to put in one episode. Again, this is Paul Kraus. I'm a counselor in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I am licensed in Michigan. I can do both in-person and distance counseling in Michigan. I'm also licensed in Arizona and do spend some time there every year um, and can practice there. But most of my practice is in Michigan right now. And you can get a hold of me at www.paulkrauscounseling.com or I work at an office called Health for Life Grand Rapids and that's healthforlifegr.com. And my direct line is 616-365-5530 and I have very cool people working in my office if you know anyone that needs an appointment i have both female and male counselors in my office we do take insurance thank you so much for your time and i hope you enjoyed this conversation with brian sabatino there's the story of the new preacher who came to town and delivered his first sermon the curious townspeople who had not been to service for a long time now lined up around the church just waiting to listen to him for the possibility of some new inspirational message He went on and on, actively holding the attention of the townspeople as he first delivered his new and exciting ideas. The service ended, and he awaited them outside the front door of the church to greet them on their way out. People shook his hand and complimented him on his stimulating talk as they left. The following week, the people turned out in great numbers once again to listen to his encouraging new ideas. However, the pastor delivered the same exact sermon verbatim from the previous week. Confused, the pastor received somewhat less of a warm reception from the people as they passed through the doors at the end of the service that week. The following week, there were somewhat less people that came to the service. There was no line to get in. The preacher once again delivered the exact same sermon. Baffled, the people barely even spoke to him on their way out after the service. The following week, he again delivered the exact same sermon to an even smaller crowd than the prior week. There were many empty seats in the church now. This went on week after week until once again very few people at all attended the service, just as with the old preacher. One week, as people left after the conclusion of the service, one man couldn't help but ask the preacher why he said the same things over and over week after week. The preacher simply replied, I've been waiting for someone to actually listen to me and live the message of the sermon during the rest of the week. Yeah, so, I mean, who doesn't like showing up to inspirational talks or experiences or whatever? But when it comes to practicing those ideas, you know, that's the inner work. That is, And that's hard. Who wants to do hard? It's very hard, and I think it takes a lot of bravery. Yeah. uh, Because... Yeah, applying, you know, if, if we were all applying self-help books, sermons, good teachings, uh, what we're learning to our lives and we were living it out, the world would be a much better place. Uh, but I think that's that's the struggle. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's the difference between knowing and, and, and deep wisdom. Mm-hmm. And, and, and knowing is wisdom in action. I think we said that earlier. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, isn't that the truth, though? <laughs> I, I, you know, it's funny with counseling. I, I work with, I'm a supervisor of counselors, uh-huh. and it's so funny in my, in this is the typical new counselor, gets so excited about helping people mm-hmm. um, that there's two things that they, they error on. First of all, they forget that the relationship between you and that person and the rapport is the most important factor about how well they're going to do in the outpatient counseling setting. Because if the person really knows you are listening to them and you're invested in what they're saying, Mm -hmm. they are going to be able to make change whether it's from your idea or theirs. Yeah. And what I say is it's got to be their idea. Sure. Um, Of course. 
We can provide ideas, examples, teaching, learning, techniques, EMDR, CBT, DBT, mindfulness, EIO, all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. And on this uh, on this farm, yeah. So we can provide all of that. I can. We can provide books, audio stuff, but it. We have to be able to see where they're at and meet them where they're at. Right. And that's the mistake of a lot of new counselors. And then the new counselor will also... And so in our practices, I know that's something that we really emphasize. And I had a person discharged recently who... It was interesting because in my experience, I felt that I really wanted to teach them some more stuff. And I really thought I could help them with A, B, and C, and D. And they said to me at the discharge, they said, you are the only counselor I've ever worked with and my, you know, and, and I, that I actually felt like I got something out of it. And I, and then they said, the reason was you didn't tell me what to do and what to think. Mm. You listened to me, you made a few suggestions, but you never forced them on me. Mm -hmm. And you would give me some ideas, but you said, it's up to me and I'm not going to tell you what to do, which I tell all my clients, I'm never going to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. I know your soul better than you. Good. Clearly, nice. yeah. if, for instance, you're in danger or something like that, I have ethics and bound duties right. that I have to do. But right. besides that judging, yeah. I'm going to be non-judging because yeah. I know that yeah. every time, <laughs> I learned this as a beginning counselor, every time I assumed what somebody needed or somebody needed to learn or what I thought they needed to do for their goal of the week, and I asked them, I said, hey, what about this? What do you think of this? They were like, what? Yeah. I don't... I don't want to do that. Right, right. Uh, that's not what I need. Yeah. And I was like, ah, oh. like every time I assumed I was wrong. Yes. So yeah. I think that's important. Yeah. Uh, but it, it is about the other thing. Well, and I lost my train of thought well, in well, a even, tangent. Even but in anyway. my program, uh, we read through group guidelines every time there's a new group member. And one of the group guidelines is no advice giving. Mm. Because advice doesn't work. No. Rodney Dangerfield's old joke about, take my advice. I'm not using it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he's funny. So, you know, it's not about giving advice. If, if advice worked, no one would come for counseling, probably. So you're right. They need to be heard. And there's that cheesy poster statement about um, people don't care what you know till they know that you care. It's true. Yeah. Um, and And when you really live that, they come up with their own internal answers. Well, and, and yeah, they come up with their own internal answers because it's always been inside of them. Part of the job of counseling is just helping subtract yeah. the pain, uh, subtract the pain, subtract the loneliness, subtract the labeling that I'm a terrible person, subtracting yeah. Yeah. the labeling that I'm a loser, subtracting yeah. the trauma, subtracting the yeah. drug and alcohol, because and then helping them with that and, and just yeah. being alongside of them until they know that they... Deep down in their heart, they know what they need to do for themselves. Yeah, yeah. And we have to trust that. Yeah. And I, I won't go into sociopath and psychopath. That's a whole other argument, which we won't even get into. But your average person, like 98% of the population or something like that, does know deep, deep, deep. It may be buried deep, but they know it. And we have yeah. to trust that. Yeah. And we all, and, and they are going to come up with the path. They're going to come up with something genius they're going to come up with something that's going to surprise you and yet right. it will be related to the right. great stories of transformation that we know right. but it's their interpretation not ours that's right. important and that's why the workbook has so many uh, stories in it because stories have been used over the millennia to teach people about uh, the grander lessons of life not just some formulaic do this to solve your problem thing um, I want to get to some more stories if that's cool. Sure, because stories sure. are why we exist, or why we've continued to exist. We've been able to organize ourselves around sure. stories. I, um, I, was, I want to get more into the book here. So there's a really good one on uh, what is it? The author's name. It's called. Um, No, this is hilarious right now because I have all these pages of bookmark that I want to read, <laughs> and we're not reading any of them. And, yeah. and so there's oh, my, go with there's my whole no. That's funny. No, I oh, want to okay. go with what I want to okay. go with what's here. I want right. to go with what's showing up right. right now. So this is the one we read a lot in the program, and, and by a lot I mean the most frequently because I haven't met anyone yet who doesn't relate to it. 
And real quick, the sound effect oh, of yeah. a dog drinking from a bowl is an actual dog <laughs> drinking from a bowl whose name is what? Augie. Augie and what's the other dog? Maddie. Ma- Maddie and Augie are hanging out with us right now. Uh, Brian's dogs. Okay, let's go with the story. I just want to let people know what that weird... That is not Brian and I drinking um, coffee out of a bowl <laughs> here because we're so tired right now. We're... we're, we're uh, anyway, go ahead. That's funny. <laughs> So this one is by Portia Nelson, um, who wrote a great book called Autobiography in, in Five Short Chapters. That's the name of the poem as well. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. The book is called There's a Hole in My Sidewalk. The name of the poem is Autobiography in Five Short Chapters. Uh, so the, it goes... Chapter one. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I am hopeless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter 2. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend not to see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I am in the same place. But it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter 3. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in my sidewalk. I see it is there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter 4. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter 5. I walk down another street. So this speaks to the whole process we've been talking about where, you know, you're doing things differently for a while, but then you find yourself going back to your old ways and you catch it, or maybe, hopefully you catch it, catch and correct, and um, it's just, it's what it's like to be human. I haven't met anyone yet who nails this process perfectly and, and doesn't falter. So almost everybody identifies with that. That's how we learn. We learn through doing. Yeah. And we learn through example. And I think it's so interesting, and this is another podcast I'll probably talk about, which is the I work with the parents of teens and young adults. And... Bless you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, anyway, it, I love working with them. Good. And uh, because, you know, it's weird. I'm about 35 years old now, and, and in my brain, I, I because I wrote so much, I think, during my 20s and early 30s uh, and uh, recorded so much things down that I, I remember what it's like to be an age group. And mm-hmm. so that has helped me help these parents but then also i've learned from parenting experts and different books i've read anyway the point is is that the a lot of the common thing that the parent will do is they will just keep telling the kid listen like your poem except they they, they'll tell them the poem over Mm -hmm. and over Mm -hmm. hey if you don't do the if you don't uh pay your car payment they're going to take your car and they're going to charge you interest and they're going to do this and you better watch out. And they keep telling him about the poem you just read. Mm-hmm. But what happens is then the kid steps in the hole, forgets to pay the car payment, and the parent rushes in out of fear and pays the car payment out of their money. And then the kid goes, oh, if I step in a hole and I'm in my early 20s, my parents will immediately bail me out out of fear. Yes. Maybe they don't even consciously think that. It's subconscious. Yeah. And thus, why should I continue paying my car payment? Yeah. I'll just make more excuses or I'll pay them back. I'll say I'll pay them back or yeah. whatever. And the parent is going, what do you expect me to do? Yeah. Let my child have a have a bad mark on their credit? Uh, yes, I am, actually. <laughs> because in a few years, you won't be able to pay their car payment, perhaps. Or yeah. maybe you want them to learn a lesson. Yeah. And so... Sometimes we have to go through the disorder and the chaos to be able to learn a lesson. But we've got to learn it on our own. Yeah. And we, we need teachers, but we have to go through the experience. Yeah. And, and there is no guarantees. Yeah. But we, you know, we want to make sure someone's safe. We want to make sure we don't just let them fall into danger. Well, and but, that's, that's a point I'm thinking of as I'm listening to you. Because um, more times than I can count, unfortunately... Uh, as we all know, people die from addiction, right? right? And and sometimes when parents stop enabling their children, they commit suicide or they die from an overdose or some other way. And so it's literally a life and death matter that we're talking about sometimes. 
Well, but what, if they keep enabling them, then they also die from an overdose. Yeah, yeah. I would say that. But, but there's that cognitive error that if I don't enable them, I'll be responsible for their death. And that's just so difficult to work with with folks. Mindfulness practice or not, that's such a profound thing when it happens. There, we don't have control. Right. We can't determine it. But I will say in a situation like that, um, where they're enabling them, and then we want them to stop enabling I would make I would make sure that I would prescribe if it's a safety issue like a drug like heroin or you know heavy alcohol use I'm gonna I'm gonna actually um, do what a lot of parents don't like to do which is actually get the person to go inpatient at a hospital if you can to be yeah. safe if you can yeah. within your power it's not always possible yeah I mean there's situations where I mean we want to always take the clinical precaution but there are situations where there's no win situations yeah and those do exist and then our job is to come alongside and help the person through the no win situation yeah. but in your in your typical 20 something who's not doing hard drugs or the parents I'm working with or maybe their kids just smoking pot or drinking mm-hmm. which is sort of common among college age people mm-hmm. sure um, the little things such as stop any ena- stop enabling them with the cell phone bill and stop enabling them with yeah. um yeah. With bailing them out of this or that, that usually that does not lead to the, the inevitable. But with drugs and alcohol, uh, with a lot a high, a high use of that, it's a very dangerous game, and that could take years to build up. I mean, I think sometimes you're talking about people in their thirties and forties whose parents are still um, cleaning them up from their latest binge, yes. and that is well. See, but that problem there that didn't take. That didn't just start last week. Right. So we come in, and that problem's been going on since they were 10. Yeah. And that's 30 years of problem right there to yeah. unravel. Versus if I've got a parent who's just got a 20-something who's kind of, they're afraid to let them out of the nest and they keep bailing them out, yeah. that problem might have only been going on for a few years. That's easier to unravel yeah. than, a, than a long-term addiction. Yeah, one of my first questions on the initial phone call now is whenever a mom is calling me about her son, my first question is, how old is your son? Because I used to expect to hear, you know, 18, right. 23, and it's, you know, it's 35, 40, 52. Mm. So, yeah, there's long-term patterns established there that take a long time to extinguish if the enabling stops. Yeah, and that, and there is, uh, I think, um, in that sense, when you're, when you're, this is getting into some really deep stuff here, but with the humanity and the difficulty of having an addicted loved one. It's so important for the people that are are in the family or friend wheelhouse of the addicted person, or the person suffering from an addiction, excuse me, yeah. um, that they get um, support through support groups. Yeah. And I know um, in Arizona they have parents of addicted loved ones. Yeah, and, get a lot of good parents feedback of, about that. Yeah, and then, actually that's all over the country now. Yeah. But there's different groups in different states and places um, to help them understand addiction to help them understand the stages to help them understand what is helpful what is not helpful Mm -hmm. um, how you can really love the person without Mm -hmm. enabling them and you can really be in their life without Mm -hmm. enabling the addiction it's so important to get support for parents and family members and then it's so important for that person to be in treatment but again you can't drag them into treatment you can bribe them to go to treatment they may not be motivated yeah so they go through the motions then they go back their old ways Sure. Yeah, I used to work in patient treatment, and I I just get so discouraged at how many times people would come back, and um, you know, God knows how much it costs each time, but they almost don't even take it seriously. What kind of money they're spending? It's supposed to be an investment in yourself, but oftentimes it's just like entertainment or something. Well, I guess that comes down to readiness, which yeah, is is yeah. um, you know the stages of change. Yeah. Pre contemplation, contemplation, yeah. action. Maintenance, preparation. relapse, Pre- preparation. Yeah. Sorry, preparation. I, I always miss preparation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all about action. <laughs> Pre contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, relapse. Yeah. But for instance, so that that does come down to what we're talking about because this stuff, all we're talking about, will work. It works differently for different people, and that's why we customize our programs and our counseling to the person. But it does take that honest contemplation, that honest investment, that honest. Yeah. that honesty and, and that want to do it. Yeah. And it is an investment. And, and quite frankly, if you're going to come in for counseling um, and you're not ready, I, I would just say save your money. Yeah, I've told people that. But if you're ready, 
to invest the money, you're, it, it, I mean, think about the benefit. Think about all the money and the, if you wasted all the time you've wasted, all the agony, all the, all the health bills for being stressed out yeah. that can be avoided if you get treatment or get somebody you love treatment. Yeah. Um, you are saving money. Yeah. And, and think about all the productivity and, yeah. at, at your work or in your, on your household that's being neglected because of an addiction or because of a mental yeah. uh, uh, trouble at this time or, yeah. or, or whatever's yeah. going on. Yeah. The, the counseling can be the best investment, but it, is, it does take that commitment, yeah. which I want to throw. That leads me to another part of your book. Mm. I've got another part of your book open, but I wanted to read this to you and get your thoughts. Okay. The, you didn't write this, but you quote this. Until one is committed. Mm, good one. By, how do you say the name? Gerta. Gerta. Oh, I say it. Okay. <laughs> Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth, the ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans, that the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would have never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events, a whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all matter of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance, which no person could have dreamed would have come their way. Whatever you do, or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Yeah. So true. I don't know how long ago that was written, but it applies today as much as ever. Um, that poem is what inspired me to start my practice, inner work oh, counseling. Okay. Because, like I was saying earlier, um, I worked in corporate America counseling centers and government counseling centers, and you know, this was really tough places to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, to to really believe that I could make a private practice work. Um, I think is a result of that poem. Yeah. Committing to it. Once you and I've and I've literally experienced the truths of those words. You know, once you commit to something, things happen that you had no idea would ha help you out along the way. And if you didn't commit to it, those things wouldn't have happened because you weren't in the same process. Right. And I think that is something that holds people back in creativity. <clears throat> A lot of everyone has great. Uh, most people have great ideas. Yeah. Uh, I really want to do this. I would really want to help kids, but this yeah. isn't practical. I'd really want to start um, a program to give back to the community, but that's not practical. Who's got time for that or whatever? I would really want to take my nephew fishing, but that's not practical. I don't. I, uh, but mm. until you when you fully throw yourself into a process or a project, yeah. You you don't know what you don't know. Coming back to that, right? That takes. We, we want to predict. We want to have. We want to know what the outcome is going to be. Yeah. If I make an investment in my time, yes. And I have this goal up on the hill yes. to, you know, start a band and record an album or make a movie or make a business. Yeah. I want to know that I'm going to have results because this right. is a big risk. Right. This is the human risk I'm taking. Yeah. But you don't know what's going to happen. But if and so if you only halfway commit, and you only oh well I. I'll work on this massive project that I have dreams of one day doing. I'll work on it every Tuesday for half an hour. Yeah. During yeah. my lunch and I'll doodle. Yeah. And my movie script's never done. Yeah. You know, take that time and that investment because, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. And every time we have a setback, we learn from it. Yeah. We're learning from our setbacks. Yeah. Because... I don't even call them setbacks. I just I just think they're just part of the process of going. You're climbing yeah. a mountain. You don't know what... And if you don't have a trail, you don't know what rocks and boulders and trees and things you're going to have to step over and venomous snakes. Right. You don't know what's there, but you know you can get to the top. You can see it. Right. But when you get to the top, it may be feel different and it may yeah. look different. It may be different. Yeah. Yeah. But throwing yourself into something is so important. Yeah. Well, that's why I like the name of your practice so much, Intentional Counseling, because I see things to people like, if I have an intention to do something, you can't stop me. Nah, and I'm sure there's a, an exception to that somewhere. Sure. But in terms of uh, an appropriate intention, uh, a soulful intention, I had an intention to start a counseling practice. No one could stop me. My closest friends and, and uh, mentors were discouraging me from doing it. Ah. Yeah, they said, that's you can't buy that building. It's too much money. It's, you know, there's too much risk here. I'm, like, eh, I'm doing it. 
<laughs> and now look where you are. How many years later since you started this yeah, place? 17 years later. All right. And uh, that's interesting because intentional counseling is still in the name of my business in Michigan. It was the name of my business in, and practice in Arizona, but somebody actually has a similar name in, in Michigan. So mm. I actually use intentional counseling Grand Rapids in Michigan, mm. which is still the which is still the baseline, the base note. But I'm working in an office that's integrative with um, naturopathic doctors and also health coaches to work on the whole person. Mm-hmm. So we're trying to do this. You know, we're, we're not just, we're going to work on mental health if that's what you want to do because that's the counseling wing, which I run. Mm-hmm. But these, these other people work on other parts of your health mm-hmm. um, and collaborate with your doctors or whatever to have a, a synergistic model. And so then we call that health for life. Okay, nice. Because we w- we don't want to just give people a short term band aid. We want to give them health for life, yeah. and that includes mental, emotional, physical, um, even questions of you know the human spirit. Yeah. And so, sure. but I, I I do love the name Intentional Counseling Services, and God bless the person who got that name. <laughs> <laughs> I had the name first, but then they registered it. In oh. different, I had the name in Arizona first for years, but oh. you know what? Uh, it's still part of my name. Whatever. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a well, name, it's a label's a label. It's yeah. what you do. Yeah. And so I, I love the word intentional because yeah, yeah. when you start being intentional and you start applying it to your life just in little ways, like, hey, um, I, I always hear this, you know, people tell me, I play piano. Mm-hmm. So I, uh, when I play piano, sometimes I was at a hotel one time just noodling on the piano and uh, somebody came up to me and he was in his 40s and he said, uh, Man, I'd always want to play piano. I wish I could play like you, and I wish I could. I said, you can. And I told him, I was like, I quit piano lessons over five to ten times. I went years without playing. And then I started actually committing myself around age 16, 18, 20, somewhere around there, to play. And let me just tell you, frankly, compared to my friends who stuck with piano lessons when they were little, I'm terrible. Mm. I am. But the more I practiced, the better I got. And now I'm to a level of intermediate i suppose skill where when you know if people hear me play a song they're like oh my goodness you're so good i'm like yeah that's because you don't play piano you don't know <laughs> but, but but you know i can fake it and play and play jazz songs and things out of fake books and play, play my own songs and people will think that's good well sure compared to whichever your experience is but they could get there too sure there's people that started playing piano in their 70s that are right. amazing and where where are we allocating our time right right so whether it's playing a piano or uh, deciding whether or not you're going to embark on a recovery process, um, it's just a matter of conscious choice, and that's what the mindfulness practice avails us to. You know, instead of I can't, you know, saying I won't or mm-hmm. I will, and if I will, doing the work on a, a moment by moment basis, letting go of the results, like you were talking about earlier, we have an attachment to the result. I want this specific outcome. Right. And that's hard to, to let go of the result if you're working so hard at it and let it be what it is versus what you want it to be. Delayed gratification, all those factors make this work really challenging. Delayed gratification and a culture of instant gratification yeah. is, is definitely difficult. Yeah. And what what did you just say about... Um, sorry, I just lost my thought. Yeah, I do that all the time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was... Oh, now my OCD part of myself wants to go back and find out what you were saying that I had like some great comment about. Yeah. Isn't that hilarious? I guess we'll just let it, let yeah. it die. Yeah. But um, so we're back to the hole in the sidewalk. We're, we're always falling in holes. And if we can start to realize that um, the hole is there and I am responsible and I can get out if, I, oh. if I'm willing to. Yes, thank you. That just yeah. brought it back. So taking radical responsibility Mm. so when i say i can't i'm projecting as if i'm some type of deity into the future i'm projecting an attitude i'm projecting a story story into the future to say i can't yeah and that is a prediction versus saying i won't which is the truth right i'm refusing to try yeah or i i will try yeah and so yeah taking responsibility i can't it's, it's about no matter what your story is, no matter what you've gone through, we have a moment today to take responsibility. And yeah. we may not get the instant gratification of the result. Yeah. Like if I just started playing piano now yeah. at this age, it might take me 15 years before yeah. I'm competent. Yeah. And quite frankly, it took me 15 years before I was competent, yeah. you know, yeah. enough yeah. to play. I mean, I played gigs, but they were terrible. But to put, be able to play at a hotel or something like that yeah. and, and have people yeah. not 
think I'm an amateur, yeah. except for the other piano player. You know, that <laughs> took 15 years. That took yeah. until I was around 30 to yeah. be able to yeah. have that confidence. But then there's the whole idea of just enjoying the process of something. Mm-hmm. It may or may not be about piano, because if, you know, playing the piano, you do want some level of result. Cause t- oh, well, sure. If it's some other process, you can you can do it for the enjoyment of the process, not not to get good at it. Um how, how do I say it? In the oh, right. <laughs> you know, the rewards of this is not for what we get, it's who we become. So with something as concrete as a piano, I get, yeah, you want some level of outcome. Well, but with this work, it can be just, you know, enjoying the journey. Well, and even with the piano, I, I was fixated on the income because I was talking about the outcome because I was talking about the story. But quite frankly, I wouldn't keep playing piano if it was just for the outcome yeah. 15 years later. I played because I loved it. You just loved to and play. And I loved the sound and I loved yeah. trying to play and I loved the... The, the sounds it could make and I loved yeah. how I could learn some songs and you know I love because you get in touch with your spirit that way I felt good it was stress relieving it was yeah. all of these things and it was creative and it was yeah. and, and so all of those years even though I wasn't to that competency level that I felt confident maybe to really put myself out there and be vulnerable I did yeah. anyway yeah. I played coffee shop gigs and different uh, things just be, uh, even when I was terrible and I couldn't let what anyone's judgment stopped me because I wanted right. to play piano and doggone it, I'm going to be a piano player. Right. Even if I didn't start when I was five and get all the cool lessons right. that, you know, maybe, and the opportunities and the discipline that maybe I needed, I could yeah. still do this. So yeah. it was about the journey. Yeah. And later on, it's about the result, but who cares? I had fun the whole time. Exactly. And that's a difficult thing to understand is, you know, the journey versus the destination. Um, I was just thinking of another, um, story in the workbook i don't know if i'd be able to find it but well this just talks about the process and uh, i compared it to a toddler learning to walk you know okay and how many times a toddler will fall down and you know what if we talked to the oh here it is should i just read it yeah read it okay um and the whole idea starts out with how hard recovery is people say that to me almost every day but this is hard i'm like yeah i know it's hard you know and once you accept that it's hard it's not quite as hard. There's a bit of a paradox there. And I, I go into this explanation about how I'm not a math person, but in my calculus courses, you know, I had to study 10 times more often than everyone else to get the grade. And my calculus teacher one day told me, this is supposed to be hard. It's okay that it's hard. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, well, then, <laughs> then it was somehow better. So right. with, whether it's piano recovery or anything else, um, it's hard. So... Um, parts of reco- I'll just read it. Parts of recovery can be as difficult as learning a new language or learning how to walk. So it's important that we bring the same quality of acceptance and patience to our progression in recovery that we would generously and compassionately give to the toddler who is learning how to walk. But for a cruel and strange moment, considering, consider this following appalling fantasy scenario as a metaphor for how we often treat ourselves while learning something new. Picture yourself talking to that toddler who is learning how to walk. Picture yourself telling her about all her mistakes and learning how to walk as critically as you might talk to yourself or secretly about someone else. Tell her how stupid she must be for falling down, how she is not as good as the other toddlers who are clearly more skilled than her. Tell her if she makes any more mistakes, she might as well give up because she is obviously no good at walking and never will be. Tell her that she should not have any feelings about falling down when she does. Ask her who she thinks she is and what she must have been thinking to believe she could walk in the first place. Tell her how our, quote, real toddlers don't make mistakes, cry, or need help, or that if the others only knew the truth about her lack of real talent that no one would want to play with her. Tell her that nothing matters but success, that if she doesn't walk the soonest and the best, that she is just not caught out for it and is wasting her time. That the end justifies the means and that she should relentlessly practice walking so she looks good better than all the other toddlers in front of everyone else. Let her know that she could only be proud of her accomplishments, not her efforts. Convince her you are only telling her all of this for her own good, that if she really wants to compete in this harsh, cruel world, that she better suck it up and never let anyone see her sweat, that perception is everything, and to never let anyone know when she's down. So, I mean, obviously no one would talk to a toddler like that right but we'll talk to ourselves and and some others uh, like that thinking mm-hmm. you know that it's going to be helpful inspirational motivational whatever missing the the whole idea that we've been talking about is you know that the journey is is the destination that um, 
self-compassion is uh, an important part of the journey. It's not, not a big value in this culture. Right. I think people confuse um, cr- tough love, that term, mm. with actual, like, really harsh criticism and callous yes. uh, speech and bumper sticker answers. Yeah. And then also, I, I've heard this one, for the counselors, this will make sense, but I've heard motivational interviewing mistaken for motivational speaking. Uh, which are two different things yeah yeah motivational interviewing is about meeting the person where they're at and yeah. rolling with it and not telling them that they're wrong yeah. even if they're having these behaviors that you know doctors would say you need to stop smoking yeah. we we roll with it because we we want to find out why the person's smoking and then we want to help them get to the how yeah how they want to quit and if they want to quit and what yeah. are their motivators yep so it, it is about that having that compassion with ourselves and in for some culture in, in our culture for some reason I don't know what it is. There's probably papers written on this, but if we're not rich and famous and important, like uh, in the you know some sort of tabloid sense, or mm-hmm. TV or internet celebrity sense, mm-hmm. then for some reason we must suck mm-hmm. or something like that. Yeah. Or if these things aren't happening for us, we aren't good enough. Yeah. And I don't I don't know what that attitude is, but I see it everywhere. Uh, people feel that they're just not good enough the way they are, that they're, right. that as a human being, they have no value. And maybe that came from trauma too. Yeah. It could have come from yeah. traumatic could experiences, yeah. but I also feel like it's cultural. I remember somebody told me a story about one of the Dalai Lamas that came over to the United States. Someone asked a question uh, and about self hatred. Maybe you know yeah. the story better yeah, than me. Do you know this story? I don't know how to tell it better than I, you. I don't know how to it. tell it that great either. Cause I wasn't there, but, uh, they, somebody asked a question, well, what do I do about all my self-loathing and self-hatred to the Dalai Lama? And the translator had to take like an hour break to explain to the Dalai Lama. And I think they had to come back the next day to answer the question yeah. because he didn't understand why someone would hate themselves yes. or loathe themselves. And he was like crying and in yes. tears because in, the, in, that, in, the, in the tradition the Dalai Lama comes from, that the human human life is so sacred and so beautiful and that we must honor our brother and sister and whoever yeah. we are around us and we must honor ourselves wherever we are, whether we're in a good circumstance or a bad circumstance or whatever we're judging as good or bad yeah. or whether we're su- in a suffering time of our life or a joyful time in our life. Yeah. And so he, he literally could not understand the concept when yeah. translated from English into his native Isn't tongue. That amazing? And so then he had to come back, and I don't remember what he said, because that yeah. would probably be yeah. the best part of the story. But I think the, the point of the story is in America, we've got this attitude, and and I think it comes from judging. Yeah, and we connect our value as human beings to uh, what we're doing, what, we're, what we've accomplished, instead of just who we are. Um, I'm just thinking of all the many forms of social media now and, and how it's led to everybody wants to be a celebrity. Sure. You know? And uh, if I'm a celebrity, then I'm okay, rather than I'm already okay. So it's... we need to get the validation from yeah. from uh, digital yeah. likes, which yeah. are, it's like a mini celebrity ship. Yeah, yeah. For, versus, you know, it's funny. I think some ce- celebrities that are pretty sane people, they just keep making movies. They just keep making music, and they don't watch all the crap speculation about their personal lives being put on to TV right. and the celebrities that end up going into rehab <laughs> and you know psych wards probably do <laughs> yeah you know I mean yeah. and so we we're obsessed with this personality and 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 it's so interesting because these are just people yeah we've we've deified yeah and, and put into I think we're projecting objectified our, Go ahead. We're, we're projecting our own greatness onto them Sure. Okay. Tell me more about that. I haven't heard of that way. Well, everybody deserves to be celebrated because sure. of what we are, who we are, what we do. I mean, we, you and I do what we do as well as Brad Pitt does what he does. So sure. why is it that he's a celebrity and we're not? Who cares? But the, fact, the point is um, we're all equally valuable in what we do and who we are. So To the people around us, to yeah. whatever. So whether or not um, 7 billion people know me... <laughs> Is irrelevant to you know this, the, the idea of celebrating who you are and, and what you contribute to life. And what would it get you? You've heard right. celebrities over and over say this. Right. Like, when you get fame or fortune, it's not what you think it's yeah, going to be. Exactly. It's actually a big pain in the butt because yeah. I can't go to the store yeah, without the re- being talked to. Yeah, the fame part of that is clear. 
uh, the the fortune part I think is less clear. But sure, I'm sure degree, that's enjoyable. The, <laughs> well, to a degree, but you right. hear all these stories about people who win the lottery and it just kills their life in one way or another. So, so yeah, I think we're getting to some good points. I'm trying to see if I should. I, I wanted to read. Okay, I've got to read this part because I bookmarked this one. Um, consider the. This is from Brian Sabatino's book, which you can only get if you come see Brian in Tempe, Arizona, <laughs> at Inner Work Counseling in this context, because he's not selling these at his yard sale, okay, <laughs> or on Amazon. This is well. Are the hipsters listening to this, I just used a label. The hipsters are going to come after you and get you to record this on a vinyl record, uh, okay. voice recording. Anyway, I know. Consider, of course. <laughs> Why would you buy anything unless it's fun? No, I'm joking. That was a joke. I, I buy CDs, whatever. I'm, something's wrong with me. Consider the following story of the five gorillas by Olson and Wilson. Oh, my William. It offers some profound insight into how we get started in our unconscious habitual patterns. There is a cage containing five gorillas and a large bunch of bananas hanging above some stairs in the center of the cage. Before long, a gorilla goes to the stairs and starts to climb toward the bananas. As soon as he touches the stairs, all the gorillas are sprayed with cold water. After a while, another gorilla makes an attempt and gets the same result. All the gorillas are sprayed with cold water. Every time a gorilla attempts to retrieve the bananas, the others are sprayed. Eventually, they quit trying and leave the bananas alone. Then one of the original gorillas is removed from the cage and is replaced with a new one. The new gorilla sees the bananas and starts to climb the stairs. To his horror, all the other gorillas attack him. Another attempt, an attack, and he knows that if he tries to climb the stairs, he will be assaulted. Next, the second of the original five gorillas is replaced with another new one. The newcomer goes to the stairs and is attacked. The previous newcomer takes part in the punishment with enthusiasm. (laughs) Next, the third gorilla is replaced with a new one. The new one goes for the stairs and is attacked as well. Two of the four gorillas that beat him have no idea why they are not permitted to climb the stairs or why they are participating in beating of the newest gorilla. They're clueless. They have no history. After the fourth and fifth original gorillas have been replaced, all the gorillas that were sprayed with cold water are gone. Nevertheless, no gorilla will ever again approach the stairs. Why not? Because that's the way it has always been done. Um, I'm going to let you comment, but I need to read the rest of this page because it's too good. Sure. But we are not gorillas, nor are we lemmings, zombings, worker bees, or ants. We have a frontal lobe in our brain that allows us to reason for the purpose of our evolutionary development. We can reason for ourselves how to live an inspired life beyond the addictive tendencies of our primitive brains, despite our history of unconscious habits and what all the, quote, normal people around us are doing, because, quote, because that's the way it's always been done, (laughs) quote. That's what responsibility means. Being able to consciously respond versus automatically reacting to what's going on within within us and all around us. That is what makes us so beautifully and powerfully human. That is what makes the, the freedom of recovery not only possible, but inevitable once we set our minds to it. Consider letting go of your elusive desire to quote-unquote be normal and focus your energy more effectively on being functional. Dysfunctional means denying that we have problems. We can't change anything we're not aware of. Functional means acknowledging our problems and taking action to work them out. One last piece of wisdom about normalcy comes to us from a poignant moment in the movie Tombstone. Wyatt Earp said, I just want a normal life, Doc Holliday. There's no normal life, Wyatt. There's just life. Now get on with living it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that reminds me of uh, how what I call cinema therapy. There's so many valuable excerpts from movies that apply to healing and growth in life recovery um but this story when i heard it oh my gosh it just blew me away because that's what we're all doing we're all doing what we do because that's the way we've always done it Mm -hmm. and if you embark on a mindfulness practice you can start to catch oh that's true and then that's that moment of truth where the compassion is so important because immediately what the ego will do will do is to start judging ourselves for, mm-hmm. for, you know, for being that way. Right. And the whole point is to be compassionate with ourselves because if we're not compassionate with ourselves, we're not going to stay with the work. If, if we, we think that if we judge and criticize ourselves for being one of the gorillas, that that's going to motivate us to change. But it's not. It's just going to teach us to stop looking, to stop being aware. Mm. 
the self-compassion is so important because that helps me stay with this long-term difficult work like the toddler you know you, you want to be encouraging of a toddler learning to walk you can't you know put them down because they tripped and fell but we'll do that to ourselves without even knowing it and so when I talk about this work and in, in an introduction of the workbook I talk about um, everyone doing it this is not like I'm a counselor you're a client therefore I'm gonna teach you how to do this work we're all either doing this work or we're not because we're all in the same boat together we're all just in various stages of our development setting aside labels like counselor and client yeah absolutely yeah absolutely wow. so that's, that's a great I just that's a great story yeah I love that story <laughs> and there's so much to that and it's in you know somebody once said to me if punishment worked there would be no alcoholics or addicts in the world right um they're punishing themselves yeah. and then we got to we try to throw them in jail and think that's going to help yeah um but uh it's like punishing a diabetic you know right yeah exactly so you know obviously consequences help us reorient mm -hmm. and then disorder and disruption and bring us mm -hmm. to a new order if we decide to or we can just live in the consequence mm -hmm. or the negative consequence mm -hmm. but a lot of what we're doing and you said like encouraging the toddler encouraging ourselves it's the same thing you know with incentives you know with kids most kids don't respond to you just saying you do this because I'm your dad. Mm -hmm. They res they they want to have power, mm -hmm. and to give them power, you have to say, okay, if you do your chores, this is your reward, and if you don't do your chores, this is the consequence. Mm -hmm. And so that there's two ends to it, mm -hmm. and it's just like that that you know we can apply that to ourselves. Um, well, if we don't do the work, we're gonna face consequences. We know it. Mm -hmm. It's gonna happen. We're mm -hmm. already suffering. Why mm -hmm. beat ourselves up for that? Mm -hmm. That's a chance to reorient and say, okay, I didn't do my inner work this week. Look at how I'm living. I'm yeah. not exactly liking this. This is on a micro level. Just, gee, Wednesday I, I rushed around, did all this stuff, worked nonstop, and I neglected my relationship. Yeah. I uh, Or I felt sick because I was too stressed and I forgot to eat mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's Thursday now. I guess maybe I can decide to start practicing Exactly. my mindfulness, my self-compassion, but if I spend all of Thursday beating myself up for what I did Wednesday, by Friday I'm going to feel depressed or right. angry. Right. So we we have choices. Right. And, and, and go it's ahead. literally a, a breath at a time process. You know, in AA they call it a day at a time, which is true, but it's you know an hour at a time, a minute at a time, a breath at a time. You don't have to wait till Thursday. If it's Wednesday, you know, like I can say, all right, this breath I didn't do what I wanted to do. <laughs> In this breath, I can wake up and do it, or stop doing it, whatever the case may be. It's that specific, you know, catch and correct 10,000 times a day. And then, weaving that back, because we're almost out of time, okay. with the neuroscience, yeah. is if you catch and correct 10,000 times, that's going to become a positive, what we will qualify as a positive habit. Yes. And if I'm... If I'm practicing self-compassion on myself once a week, and then twice a week, and then three times a week, and then four times a week, sooner or later, when I make a mistake, I'm going to laugh at it. Yes. I'm going to have a good laugh and go, ha, silly human. Yes. And then I'm just going to keep doing it. And that is where love wins. That's a great way to say it. You know, Descartes said, I think, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. I like to think of it as, I laugh, therefore I am. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a brilliant mile marker for, for your progress and recovery, if you can laugh at yourself. You're doing all right. Right. What do they say? <laughs> Take it all seriously, but hold it all lightly. Yeah. 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 So, and, and laughter is, is so important. And I, and I think it's, you know, that, that, that's a tough subject. That's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> let's just, let's just keep, my brain is racing. I had nothing to say except. Yeah. Know. I have so much, every time we're, we mention something, 10 other things come up, but um, people ask me about burnout in this job. And they're surprised to hear that I tell them about how much we laugh in the program. Right. We have fun in there. Yeah. It's hysterical, some of the stuff that we talk about. And uh, if, if, you, if you don't tap into that dimension of this process, you're cheating yourself out of a, a really important part of it. It's a part of humanity, part of human yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's important that we laugh in yeah. counseling sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it takes some time to get there. Yeah. I think sometimes yeah. because you know you're coming in with some serious trauma or story. Yeah, I'm not. You know, I'm not going to make any jokes, or no. you're not going to make any jokes either. But eventually, 
you know, when you move past some things, humor is such an important part to yeah. be able to. It's like two sides of the same coin. You got tragedy and, and comedy. You know the, the ah, famous masks. Right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. Oh wow, I like that. <laughs> yes. Um, so, any fu- oh, you know what? I've got to do this final thing, and then we'll we'll okay. wrap up. Okay. There is this poem by Rumi. How do you say his first name? Uh, I say it Jalaladin. Jalaladin Rumi, who is. That's, if you want to know who he is, just look him up because I'm not going to read the bio. But I think this poem talks about something you talked about earlier. Well, we've been talking about. It's called The Guest House. This, be, this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight, the dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door, laughing, and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes, because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. That's a heavy poem, isn't it? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Yeah, I've only had a couple people comment on that poem. It's just... You have to be in a really good place to take that in. Yeah. Um, I think we've all heard versions of that idea, though, that if I shut down um, what we call good feelings, then I'm also, I'm sorry, if if we shut down what we call bad feelings, then we're also shutting down good feelings. Rumi's talking about, you know, open up the channel for everything and then everything will flow. Mm -hmm. That's my perception of this poem. And uh, that's hard to do, you know. It's hard to convince people that, Feeling your pain is a safe thing. You're not going to get hurt by it. It hurts to feel it, but you're not. it's not going to damage you. And then when you let that pain flow, you're, you're carving way for your joy to flow as well. The highs and lows of the human experience. Yeah. And I would even say further, beyond the emotional part, just when we're trying to do something in our life. And we close down and we say, I'm going to restrict I, this experience to this way it's got to go my way it's got to go this way yeah. and then look what happens normally when that happens it doesn't go well yeah. and then if we stop for a moment we go wait a minute what's what's actually arriving here what's actually coming through my guest house all of a sudden a new idea will pop into our mind or a new way of doing it mm-hmm. or 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 we'll laugh at some thing we did and decide to change it yeah. and so that's that's taking that that moment to have that perspective to shift our perspective from our narrow way of thinking and and us our human egos thinking that we know something yeah when i you know people the more we know about the universe the smaller we're becoming right like we look at ants and we're like look at how small they are we're so big when i was a kid you know yeah and now the big find that we're the ant pile well now we're we're getting to be smaller and smaller as the universe gets bigger and i think that i think uh it's uh you know, it's important as humans to know your to know your shape and know your space and, and not let your ego run things yeah. because things don't go well and you're going to experience much more love in your life and much more joy and I'm sorrow too, but you're going to you're yeah. going to be able to experience that if you're opening up to what's actually happening now and yeah. not trying to control it. Yeah, I think that's the bottom line of the whole mindfulness practice is just to change our relationship to our ego. Yeah. So by changing our relationship to time which is the beginning, by taking that time out of our time to be in, instead of chronological linear time, we're getting into a deeper time mm. by breathing and, mm. and experiencing this moment, mm-hmm. then we can do the work of compassion, which then can tell our ego to calm down mm. or, or mm. move away from being in the control mm-hmm. of our lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the most helpful things anyone ever said to me was in a, some kind of a weekend retreat thing. The guy said, sit down and shut up. No one cares what you think. <laughs> <laughs> and he oh. was right. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny. You know, yeah, that reminds me of a quote I like to say a lot. Um, oh, I can't even remember it now. <laughs> That's hilarious. See, yeah. no one cares. Oh, oh, what other people think of me is none of my business. That's beautiful. I love that one. And I think that's so important. Yes. And but yeah, you're right. Uh, let's listen. <laughs> let's open up. Let's yeah. see what's uh, the other thing. The humans always struggle with. We struggle with the other mind problem, where 
we keep forgetting that other people's minds, even though they're probably shaped the same and neurologically work in a similar fashion, are so completely different. The yeah. way that they think based on their experience and their age and their, um, you know, biology. And okay. that... <laughs> difficult to appreciate that isn't we, it? yeah we assume that people think like us they don't right they don't they uh, everyone's different and that's that's the beauty and the intrigue of why i love doing this work and uh, <laughs> and i think i'm excited you know because this is a job where you die with your boots on yeah i don't, I don't feel like retiring darn it i right. want to keep working right and i'm young so. yeah but, yeah i mean y'all i'm still working is he a couple days a week yeah no kidding he mostly that's just writes books that's great but urban y'all yeah if you want to read his books he's good um did we, you ever read his book, Love's Executioner? I did read Love's Executioner. Oh, that's a good one. I love that one. I read actually about five of his books. Yeah. He's fantastic. Yeah, He's yeah. even written some fiction, historical fiction. Wow. Actually, I would think he'd like it mm. about philosophy. Neat. Um, we're about to b have to wrap up, but Brian, thank you for being my guest. Thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to, how can people get in touch with you and come to your program? Well, I practice in Tempe, Arizona, and uh, my website is inner dash work counseling dot com um, my email is inner work what is my email my email is brian sabatino at icloud dot com That's what's your phone number what's phone number that? is four eight oh two two one one oh one three okay and you also take major insurance and cash yes and uh they can come in and it's an it's a group counseling experience and uh, that you'll if you want to know more check out brian on the internet and you can just you can use the Google and and just put in Inner Work Counseling Tempe Arizona and you should find it. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, I think that's about it. I yeah. appreciate you yeah. coming on the show. This has been fantastic. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks. I'm excited for people to hear it. And uh, if you want Brian's book, sorry, you can't order it. <laughs> Come to Arizona and bring him a lot of uh, chocolate and gifts, and he may he may break his rule. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm in favor of manipulating <laughs> ma manipulating that. So, all right. All right. Thanks, thanks Brian. Okay. And there you have it. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of The Intentional Clinician. This has been Paul Krauss, licensed professional counselor. If you would like an appointment and you're in the Grand Rapids area or know someone in the Grand Rapids area, you can reach me directly at 616-365-5530 or... Go to my website, paulkrauscounseling.com or healthforlifegr.com. If you know someone looking for a female counselor, we have several female counselors working at my office, Health for Life Grand Rapids, and a naturopathic physician as well. So I'm happy to be working in such a fun place with so many talented people, and I'm glad to be offering these podcasts. If you find this valuable, feel free to give me some email feedback. My email can be found on my website. And also, I do counseling supervision in Grand Rapids as well. Thanks so much. See you next time. Celery salt, and I believe some sort of garnish. Well, that makes relish. sense to me intuitively. I only have mustard, but not to the right. In Chicago, there's a lot of rules. <laughs> <laughs> it's not written down anywhere. Huh.